take a little slow resentment and an ounce of small regret. It was interesting. I, I have never really analyzed the entirety of my career. I mean, as a whole, I just live it one, you know, one day at a time. I just keep going forward and writing the songs and making the records. And the really the impetus to do it came from outside of me. It was my producer and my manager who had the idea in the first place, you know, that, that we've reached a milestone. You know, you're going to be 70. You've been doing this, writing the songs for 50 years. You know, let's let's take a look at the whole thing. And and I uh, I learned. I learned how young I was. <laughs> you know, that's one of the things you tend to forget. And but I learned that even as a kid, I I was amazed at how sturdy some of the songs were. You know, they 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 stand up. And you know, and the example that always pops into my head is the first song I ever wrote, which was uh, "Devil Got Your Man." And. Uh, I wrote that song when I was 19 years old. Uh, you can imagine a 19-year-old writing a song called Devil Got Your Man. I mean, how real is that? And what does a 19-year-old know about the devil? Well, it turns out 19-year-olds have lots of devils of their own, you know, that, that they may imagine are much bigger than they are. But at the same time, um, I could approach that song now, today, and... I can make it real. I can. It holds up. It'll take the weight, you know. It, it it'll support fifty more years of experience and still sound even more genuine than it did at the time. And I thought it sounded pretty genuine back then, you know. But I didn't know anything. <laughs> you know, none of us know anything when we're nineteen, in spite of the fact that we're convinced that we do.
Can't you see? I can't explain. Boy, I'm a little like a link of chain. A ring around another. takes the stage whether they know what they're doing and whether you're in good hands. And if you see it, you can feel this inner sense of relief. Okay, I can let go. I could, just, I could take his ride, her ride, whoever's ride it is, you know. And there's, there is um, a technique to that. I can't explain it in so many words, but it's just something that I've learned, you know, to be able to come out and talk to a room full of total strangers as if they know exactly what you're talking about at all times. And all you have to do is, is make the slightest little nod, you know, of acknowledgement to that audience. I know you're there, is what that says. I know you're there, and I know you care. And, I, and I'll, I'll live up to that, you know. You don't want to have that. I mean, there's a whole other part of show business that requires that wall you know, the invisible wall between the performer. But that's not what I do, and it's not what musicians in this genre do at all, you know. I want, it, I want every person in the room to feel like, in some sense, I'm sitting in their lap, whispering in their ear. <laughs> If I were young again, I'd pay attention to that little unknown dimension, the taste of endless time. It's just like water, and it runs right through our fingers. The flavor of it lingers like a rich red wine. In those days, we were single, and we lived them one by one. Now we hardly see them. I got plenty left, I've set my sight on Don't wait up, leave the light on I'll be home soon I have never seen my life in such a hurry But if I stop to worry I get left behind it's just a party, but you don't get invitations And there's just one destination, you better be on time For years we rhymed in couplets, and we sang them two by two Now we hardly rhyme at all, but here's a few And if they hurt, there's bullets left to bite on Don't wait up, leave the light on Oh, that drummer in my head needs inspiration Has a lack of syncopation And it holds me to a line It's just so hard to leave these cages that we think in By 
high stages we just sink into a slow decline For years we lived in Wall's time and we danced it three by three Now it's hard to dance but if you stick with me We got what we need to spend the night on Don't wait up These races that we've run were not for glory, no moral to the story. We run for peace of mind, but the race we're running now is never ending. Space and time are bending, and there's no finish line. But I will live to be a hundred. I was born in '44, thirty left. I've been left for dead before, but I still fight on. Don't wait up, leave the light on. I'll be home soon. Cause I've been left for dead before, but I still fight on. Don't wait up, leave the light on. I'll be home soon. Thank you, folks. You, know, you, you get these Lightning Hopkins records, and, and that was my first real blues record, was Lightning Hopkins Blues in My Bottle and uh, from Prestige Bluesville. And you sit there, and you, you know, I was totally baffled. I had no idea what he was doing. I thought there was more than one person playing the guitar. And, and, and then I, you know, but I worked and did the best I could on learning that stuff. And then John Hurt was a total revelation because that was my first exposure to that sort of real syncopated three-finger style. And um, it's all a vast puzzle to you. You feel like you'll never get to the bottom of it. But you do, you know. And then what do you do? You know, it's just like you keep looking. You keep looking for that that high of... The mystery, you know, you have no idea how it's done, you know, but you got to figure it out. And so you keep looking for those things, those little things. And they come in different ways now. And I've, I'm still not what you call a schooled musician at all. I, I, my, my ignorance about how to talk about music is, is voluminous. But, but uh, uh, I keep learning things, you know, I keep learning little pieces of it. And, and my producer, uh, David Goodrich, Goody is a, a consummate musician, schooled and unschooled. He knows all this stuff, but it doesn't get in his way, <laughs> you know. But every once in a while, he'll say, he'll say, you know, once he said after we finished one record, he said, play me a major scale, you know, just a chord box, you know, a scale box. And I, so I played it for him. He said, now play me a minor scale. And so I got through it, you know, but I had to sort of pick and hunt. And he says... If you learn minor scales, if you can play those the same way you play major scales, it'll make a huge difference in the way you think about your playing. And he was right. You know, it didn't take much work. It just, but it opens up all sorts of things. And so I, I didn't know about those. <clears throat> but you know, I don't suddenly say, "Oh, this has revolutionized my guitar playing." I just add it to the toolbox. You know, and then it shows up in unexpected ways that uh, surprise me. Take a little slow resentment 
and an ounce of small regret. Half a cup of wounded pride that hurts inside and has not faded yet. Add a pinch of passion and a double shot of booze. When your self respect is crashing, you can drink it up and you can cash in on the blues. On the blues. Ain't it funny how the sun inside will never reach my shadow in the shade? Ain't it funny how the colors seem the brightest just before they start to fade? If you say that ain't funny, if you say you're not amused, I'll say I ain't surprised My sense of humor is paralyzed by the blue By the blues How long I got to wait, I'm running late Somebody Get me out from under, it's a wonder I'm on this side of the tomb Boy, but the preacher teaches patience In the ancient sense And it stretches out for years I can't stand to listen I can't see beyond this glistening It's never nice to hear advice you know you'll never use The spirit might be willing, but the flesh is out there It's shilling for the blues For the blues It's never nice to hear advice you know you'll never use Spirit might be willing, but the flesh is out there, still shilling for the blues. I, where I write from, I, I these days, I really try to be clear. Uh, I know that some of them have impressionistic um, overtones and, and a kind of um, a feeling of that I'm not quite saying exactly what I mean. And I used to indulge in that to a certain extent when I was younger. Now, I'm really trying to get an idea across. And sometimes they're pretty complex ideas and you've only got three minutes to do it. And so the way that you do that is to make the songs as clear cut as possible. Try to make your rhymes um, stand out in such a way that they make people remember lines. You know, I always feel like if you can write a song and somebody hears it for the first time and they can remember even one line out of it, you've won. I mean, that's a winner right there. You know, because sure enough, if they remember the one line, they'll come back and hear it again, and pretty soon they'll be able to sing the whole song along with you. That's another charming thing. I love that when you see an audience and you can look around and see five or six people who are singing the words along with you. It's just great. Oh, man, you feel like you made a connection. It's great. This is perfect.
<laughs> I love this room. You know, I, I like a room. <clears throat> now, see, my agent would rather I played room rooms where I can't see 90% of the people because they're so far away, you know, and, but they're all there, you know, and they've paid to come in. But I, I love the feel that is in this room right now. A sense of cohesion. Everybody knows why they're there and everybody pays attention and everybody takes their own little trip, but they take a group trip as well. And we build a little thing, you know, between us, me and you. And, and the thing that we, that we make is ephemeral. It has a half-life of, you know, maybe 20 minutes after we all leave the building while we're still thinking about it, you know. And, and then it starts to fade away, and then we have to recreate, you know, the next night and the next night. And that's, that's what's cool. And to feel, to be in a room this size where I can look at everybody and sort of feel that whole thing and, and not have to sort of subdivide in my brain. Because in a big concert, you subdivide the audience. You just divide it into sections, and you treat each section as an individual. That way, you cover the whole thing. And and, and really, you know, most of the people in the audience will get the sense, you know, that you're talking to them at least part of the time. You know, and it is. But the real deal is better. You know, in the end. You know, and you know, I think it enforces a, a no bullshit level to the performance as well because you have the feeling that if you don't do it right they're going to see <laughs> and probably let you know about it <laughs>
clever for your own good I tell you was right before your eyes Intelligence is no defense against what this implies Cause in the end no one will sell you what you need You can't buy it off the shelf You got to grow it from the seed Cause I got in 66 and I uh, I got to Cambridge and I sort of worked my way up the East Coast you know, took a took probably four or five months to get up to Cambridge but I had a connection uh, I had met Eric von Schmidt who had been very encouraging to me I met him down in Florida and uh, he said where are you living and I said New Orleans and he said oh, you got to get out of there <laughs> <laughs> and he was right, <laughs> you know. He says nobody's going to hear you, and uh, and I, you know, and it, it, I'd come to realize that, that, you know, none of the rediscovered blues men that I was interested in ever played in New Orleans. They never got south of, of St. Louis, you know. If they, and uh, you know, so <clears throat> I, I headed up eventually up up to New York and and Boston. And uh, New York scared me a little bit, you know. But Cambridge, Boston, Cambridge. I mean, I, I'm the son of a university professor, you know. You point me to any city that's got a half a million students running around, and I feel right at home, you know. And so I, and I did. And the whole scene, the big scene uh, in Boston and Cambridge at that time was at the Club 47, and all those people were essentially faculty brats just like me <laughs> you know? he used to say what does a bluegrass banjo player do when he decides to quit playing bluegrass banjo he goes back to graduate school that was that. <laughs> so, but uh it was it was great um uh, you know, there was the wonderful thing about the scene in those days was that there wasn't just the Club 47. There were four or five coffee houses on Charles Street at the foot of Beacon Hill that we all played at all the time. And we played there. We were working every night in and around Boston, you know. And if you had a car, they could get you someplace, you know. You, and it was the 60s, you know. If you made 15 bucks a night, that kept body and soul together. You know, that was plenty of money. And it was it was wonderful, I, you know, lots of hard work and meeting people and saying, "Oh man, I got a new song. You got to hear this." And you'd listen to it and you'd think to yourself, "Wow, it's not that great, but I sure do like that lick." <laughs> you, know, and, and you could you could yeah <laughs> right. You you do that lift. It was you know and and um, my suspicion, although I don't know it from first hand, is that that's still going on in Boston and Cambridge where the kids are still working like that and they're all swapping around and jumping in out of this band and that band and, and that's how people like that's how bands like Rusty Bell happen you know it's just and uh, you know it, it seems like so far away but I don't think it's changed that much I'm 
flip my switches, but I don't turn on. Ain't a flicker, baby. I got no juice today. I had a lighter in my carry on, but the airline took it away. Well, it ain't. Showers, yeah, my mind's a hurricane. I called a taxi about an hour ago, but I bet you he's lost in the rain. No mail today, my phone never rings, nothing works when you're gone, my mind is humming but my heart won't say. percent of the songs that I write always start with a guitar part just a little lick you know and uh, the lick progresses and you start playing around with it and develop uh, you know a harmonic rhythm a, a chord progression <clears throat> uh, and once you got a chord progression then let's see we'll see if I can show you something let me see here's one for instance, if we have this little thing, in. this doesn't have any guitar tricks. It's just a pure progression. I didn't come up with any nice little lick. So then you get you got to start scat singing against that, all right? You know, to, to try to find out where the tune's gonna lie in those chords, you know. So you just sort of go, ba da 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 Bye, don't eat and go down. Bye, don't eat to see my dad. Hold on, hold it on. So then, what are you going to do? You know, now you get this nice little tune, sort of. It. And uh, what I do. Yeah. <laughs> so now you start thinking about. I don't think about anything. I mean, one of the one of the the most widespread illusions about songwriting is that the songwriter actually knows what he's going to write about, and in fact, it's usually much more organic than that. It just evolves, and you find out what the song's about halfway through. So, so then you start scat. I I start scat singing, and I just mouth nonsense syllables. And if you're close enough, and or can hear like you can hear right here now, you'll hear like little suggestions and you'll think I've I'm almost actually singing the words and if you could just get closer you'd be able to understand them you know but <laughs> so there we go like something like this I'll just do it for you okay 
I don't find what I said you'll say. I don't believe I could say down no, love no, is that me don't call is it me I don't I don't call if I don't if I don't I don't I don't I don't uh, yeah, but what will happen is that as you sit there doing that over and over, and sometimes I, I'll record, a, you know, a, a passage of it and just sit there and listen to it and hum to myself with a, a big legal pad in front of me and a, and a ballpoint, and and as you as you go through there, little words start to fall together, and then you come up with a line, and it, and it, and it, and then it's a question of of trying to figure out what that part of your brain is getting at. And it's a very skittish part of your brain. It's very shy, and it doesn't like to be looked at. You know, I have a, a friend um, who uh, used to say he writes like this. I'm not watching you. Not <laughs> you know, Cliff Everhart said that. To me, right? yeah. Yeah. And he's right, you know, that's the way it is, you know. So you, you just keep working until you've collected enough of these these little tidbits, and and then if you look at them, sometimes you have to turn the sheet around a little bit and look at them a little cross-eyed, you know. You, you get a sense of what that part of your brain is trying to get at, you know. What's he trying to say? And you reach a point, I, and I always feel like it's a... It's almost a, uh, an, a, not an epiphany, but a, a, an open. It's like a book opening. The song opens itself to you, and you go, "Oh, I see what this is about." Well, then, then your rational brain can take over, and and you can start pushing and manipulating without scaring away the critter that's coming up with this stuff, you know. And uh, and gradually, you know, it just works out and you look at it and say, then it really becomes, the craft starts to come in then, you know. This isn't going to work. I can't use that rhyme. And, and then people ask me about rhyme too. Rhyme is important in its own right because rhyme will give you ideas. You know, you can, you can come up with a rhyme and say, ooh, I need that rhyme. And then it'll change the whole tone of the verse about even what it's about just so you can get that thing in there, you know, and it's, it's serendipitous and it's, it's an adventure every time, you know. If it were cut and dried, everybody would do it. <laughs> you know, it's a... I've been a fool, a singular cool, all by myself. Nobody showed me how I was born that way Every day's a solo played on a single string Nobody shows up and nobody walks away But what do I do when the tune is through? How am I gonna get me home? What would you say if I turned your way? you help me now? I can't do it alone. Because lonesome is as lonesome does, and I do it. Perfect practice keeps me next to me. And nobody needs to need me. There's nothing to it. All the friends you don't make always let you be But where do I go to close this show This one man band to the bone Why does it feel like such a deal To say help me now I can't do it alone To say help me now I can't do it alone
bitter taste to this wicked waste of emotion And all the time it took to dig myself this hole Finding peace of mind through this commotion Terrifies my solitary soul Why don't you tell me how to see outside of me Tell me what I should have known Why don't you start at the top and Don't stop till I can say help me now I can't do it alone Yes, tell me how to see outside of me Tell me what I should have known Why don't you start at the top and Don't stop till I can say help me now I can't do it alone Won't you help me now I started when I was nine years old. I found my mother's ukulele in the attic and, and started playing with that. And then I was totally addicted to it. Had an uncle that showed me three chords. That's all you need. And then I, and then uh, the family. When I was eleven, almost twelve, uh, my family moved to France for a year and a half. And my dad was traveling all over Europe. And for some reason, we didn't bring the ukulele. I don't know why. There was no room for it, I think it was the rather shoddy, lame excuse, but I was broken hearted and uh but <clears throat> in the fall of that year my we were living in paris and my my dad had gone down to to uh, do some work in Spain, and he came back with a guitar said here, think you can handle this and so um uh, I got a book and found some chords and, and uh started off again and you know it's the one it's the one thing in my life that I it was not a momentary enthusiasm I went through you know tons of you know short-lived enthusiasms uh, but that one always stayed and I always did it in spite of and you know instead of what I should have been doing instead of what I was supposed to be doing I was off playing my guitar and trying to sing and and um, what's phenomenal to me now, in retrospect, is wondering why it never occurred to me to, to actually study music. You know, I, it, to me, it, though it was something that I did as an avocation and it wasn't proper for me to, it would, it would be almost like cheating, you know. <laughs> And yet, on the other hand, I had a father who who used to tell me, you know, find something that you like to do and then figure out a way to make a living at it, which is what I wound up doing in the end. Yeah, it's good to be loved. <laughs> um, well, yeah, human interaction. Yeah, that's, that's what I like, the things that make us happy and the things that make us sad. And... The idea that life is what you make of it, you know, it's not a dress rehearsal. You know, the pie ain't in this guy. <laughs> the pie is right here. You got to learn to eat it. If I were young again, I'd pay attention to that little known dimension, the taste of endless time. It's just like water, and it runs right through our fingers. The flavor of it. Lives